Hi, this is uh, Mitch Kramer and Trey Talley, and uh, this is Fluent Financial's June webinar for 2023. Uh, a lot of information we're going to cover. It's kind of interesting. Um, we thought this would be a shorter webinar, but the amount of information that Trey has come up with is very relevant. And when we did our, our walkthrough this morning, um, we asked people, what sites can we cut out? And there really wasn't a lot to cut out. So this is going to be a little longer than we expected. We expected 15 or 20 minutes and our, our practice run was a little over 30. Um, I don't think it will be quite that long, but there's some really good information we'll share. So um, first thing we'll go through, this is the compliance piece and any information that's presented today is the opinion of Fluent Financial, not private client services. And to get started, uh, this is kind of the year-to-date market performance. And what you have is the Dow Jones, um, the S&P here in uh, white, the NASDAQ, and then the Russell 2000. Um, so the markets year-to-date are up, um, but there's only a handful of stocks that are keeping the market up. Um, we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at the economy, where we're at, where we're headed. Um, the stocks have continued their rally, and there's just a very few that have done well. The technology has been a very, very strong sector. So if we go to the, the next slide, uh, if you look at our performance year to date and then the beginning of 22 uh, through uh, June 14th, the indexes are here uh, from January of last year till the 14th, and then our larger portfolios are, are listed here. And across the board, our portfolios have held up very well. Uh, our income producing portfolios, specifically uh, stock income and advantage have done extremely well. Uh, V&O, which is our aggressive uh, stock, and we have some bonds in it now has lagged somewhat. Um, we are again, conservatively positioned Then our models growth, growth with income have held up uh, pretty well. Um, we are still positioned conservatively. We have been using uh, treasury bills instead of having money in cash. And as we go through this presentation, I think you'll understand why we're, we're taking that, that tactic. Uh, the next slide is the leading economic indicators. And we've been showing this chart for a number of months now. And what you basically have is this yellow line here, which represents zero. And anytime these blue mountain valleys occur, a recession, which is represented by the red bars, occurs. So for the second month in a row, we've been at negative eight. And that basically means we are going to be going into a recession. The question is when. Um, I'm almost getting feelings like I carry it on the stick because I thought it would probably be here by third quarter. It may be, maybe it's fourth quarter now based on what the Fed said. Um, I'll go through this hope slide. Uh, pretty quickly, and Trey's going to go in more detail about each one of the, the components. But the hope slide is a uh, kind of a 24-month signal when Fed starts raising rates and what segments of the economy go into a recession first. And housing went in about a year ago when interest rates went from 3 to 6%, basically killed the housing market. We're starting to see a little bit of recovery in that. Rates are more normalized, and, and those of you who are, are over 40 years old on this call will look at the rates today and say, hey, those were some pretty good rates compared to what we paid back in the 80s. Uh, new orders uh, took a hit in the late summer, early fall, and profits are starting to get hit somewhat. They've kind of leveled off, and unemployment or the employment area of the market is still solid, but we're starting to see cracks on that. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the, the next slide over to Trey, and he'll talk more in detail about uh, the housing and, and the orders, profits, and employment. Thanks, Mitch. So um, we start off uh, looking kind of at housing, and a, and a couple of these slides we'll just kind of blast on through because not much has um, developed um, since the last time we spoke last month. Um, and so what we're looking at here as we start is the uh, sentiment uh, index for home builders. And um, so this one here at a reading of 50 is what we would consider neutral. Um, obviously, it's had a, a big drawdown as illustrated there on the chart. Um, it's had a small bounce there back to more neutral level. So that is a small bright spot. Um, however, when contrasting that with the next slide, which is the building permits, which is more of hard data, um, that has not quite seen the recovery that we've seen in some of the sentiment. Um, and so at this point, it's still a mixed housing recovery. 
Um, and at this point, um, we don't really want to put any stock into it quite yet. Um, and so housing continues to be weak. That was a story all last year, beginning in the first quarter. Um, that is still the case as uh, supply is still constrained and mortgage rates are high. But that does lead us to the new order section yeah. here. Yeah, let, me, um, let me just say something real quick, Trey. Um, one of the big challenges in the housing market is if you are in a house um, and you need to move and relocate, let's say you're not retired or pre-retired, you're having to give up this incredibly low interest rate that you may have and pay a much higher rate. So it's almost like uh, the old golden handcuffs you have on your house. So that's further restricted supply and it's made it much more challenging. A lot of the realtors we talk with say one of their biggest challenges is not just the higher rates compared to the past previous years, but the lack of inventory. So uh, Trey, the new orders, we're also seeing some declines in that in this sector as well. Yes, and um, that's um, that started again kind of early last year, maybe around the summertime, um, is when we started to see new orders uh, by the purchasing managers all over the nation indicating that they were going to start pulling back on activity. So below 50 here, uh, it's sitting at 42 and a half almost there. And uh, so this one for the manufacturing section uh, is very contractionary, very consistent with what we've seen in prior recessions, and there has been no recovery here. Um, which gives us uh, further skepticism for that housing bounce there. We think it's more idiosyncratic. Um, there is some color we can add to that. But the, the services section of new orders uh, tends to respond a little later, um, but this one is continuing its um, decline lower. It's still uh, expanding at 52, uh, just over 52, but um, this one here is losing its steam, and we would expect this one to start contracting pretty solidly as we head into the recession. Um, that is not expected to be until the back half of this year. Uh, so new orders uh, continues to be a weakness there. Uh, corporate earnings here, uh, that's what we're looking at for the S&P 500 earnings per share on a trailing basis. And um, so that pink line there has just started moving sideways since the middle of last year. Um, and it is, it's a little lower, but not too much. Uh, the real story kind of behind corporate profits is prior recessionary environments, um, as input costs were rising, companies were trying to absorb that as much as possible to keep volume steady and absorb those prices and um, so that customers wouldn't have to feel that. Um, this time around, it's been, it's been a lot different. Uh, companies have um, passed on a lot of that price inflation to the consumer. Um, so corporate margins, both the gross margins, profit margins actually increased through uh, out last year um, as companies were just passing that on to retain profitability. So that's been a good news for stocks. It's bad news for consumers. It does hurt their purchasing power and their balance sheets. Uh, but that's kind of why corporate profits have been hanging around here in terms of the weakness of the hope cycle. Um, there's a story on employment that we still believe is yet to be told, um, but we are moving closer. Uh, we, we have over the past couple of weeks, we have gotten uh, some, some pickup in the amount of people applying for unemployment across the nation. And so that's, uh, we've had two weeks of over 260. Markets generally care uh, as they get over 300,000 per week. So we're not quite there yet. And, and these are only a few data points. So we'll be, um, we won't be hasty to draw conclusions, but we are seeing, we've alluded over the past couple of months that there's, there's a slow tremor that's growing into a quake in the employment. Um, and, and this is starting to show up in some of the data. Um, and that's even kind of confirmed here on the next slide, the last slide, which is the unemployment rate, which ticked up to 3.7. That's at the top of its range. It has been there over the past, uh, you know, 18 months or so. Um, but it is kind of on an upswing. It's moving above some of the moving averages. Um, not enough to draw big conclusions that the hope slide has finally arrived at employment, um, but it is getting closer for sure. Yeah, and this next slide, Trey, there's some divergences between what the government shows and household survey numbers. Why don't you kind of explain what's going on here? I think in a lot of ways, this is more accurate than some of the government surveys. Yeah, so you have to apologize. We um, we tried to blow this chart up because it was originally pretty small. So it's a little blurry, so I apologize. But uh, these are two different um, measurements of of payroll and employment here we do in the United States. And so that's split by household and establishments. Um, so the green bars you see there, uh, that is the establishment survey and that blue bar that's kind of going the opposite direction is the household survey. They measure uh, a few different things. Household employment uh, is only gonna count full-time employees um, and the establishment survey counts part-time employees. Uh, they also count if you 
leave one job and start another and you're kind of on the payroll both at the same time all that gets counted in that green bar there but that pat the prior month you've seen that divergence where um the green bar showed you it created 300,000 jobs and the blue bar had showed that you had lost 300,000 jobs um and so there's a diverging picture uh, arriving between the two uh, we also look at things like um you know average work week and stuff like this kind of take the product and um it, it doesn't matter how you splice it. Uh, employment is getting pretty weak pretty quickly. Uh, this one here is just, uh, it, it's a differential between um, the survey of jobs plentiful and jobs hard to get, the survey responses. And that's done by the Conference Board, a nonprofit economic organization. Um, and so what you see here is um, jobs are becoming less plentiful and jobs are becoming increasingly difficult to get. So we're starting to see a downward move in that, that blue mountain chart there, very consistent. Uh, for what we see prior to recessions um, and what we would see kind of before some of that unemployment rate really starts to tick higher. Um, so, you, you know, why are we spending so much time about, jo time about jobs? As investors, it, it really does matter to us. And so one of the, uh, the things that we wanted to highlight here is when we look back at recessionary bear markets uh, since the 1960s, uh, what we saw is uh, rising unemployment claims uh, coincided with weak stock markets in every single time. Um, and so on the chart here, it's a little busy. You've got, um, you've got eight different uh, charts there, but this is all the individual bear markets looking back to 1960s, mid 1960s. That orange line is the, unemploy uh, the unemployment claims. We've inverted that just to be a little easier on the eyes. So normally again, you're getting a pickup in unemployment claims and a trend down in markets. And you can see it doesn't matter which uh, bear market we're looking at, the, the picture is the same. When people start to uh, lose their jobs, uh, risk assets start to head south. Um, that is still uh, a quite a, a possibility. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. Uh, we're starting to see that. So we cannot just kind of uh, disregard, uh, you know, di despite some of the price action, which we'll get into, we can't disregard the risks that still lay ahead of us. We don't want to be silly and be picking up pennies in front of steamrollers. So. Yeah, and I think the other point that's in, important to make here is that two thirds of our economy is what we spend as consumers. And as long as we have a paycheck coming in on a regular basis, we can buy the goods and services that we need or want. Once that paycheck stops, um, that consumption decreases. And since that's you know two thirds of our economy, that leads us in, into the recession and the market falls uh, follows fairly quickly there afterwards. So that's why we've been uh, more conservatively positioned year to date. We still are now. So let, let's talk a little bit on how these higher rates are impacting the housing dynamics and specifically the multifamily. And what we have here is the uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, the lending volume and basically as rates started to really accelerate last year, the lending volume has really decreased and the, the CapEx and the margins in the apartment area has really gotten squeezed. Uh, we have uh, one client that works in that area and they're doing very few deals uh, because of this uh, uh, issue. So it's getting more and more difficult to build uh, apartments at, at good margins. And they're still doing that. Um, the housing market, there's still a lack of supply because of the building costs, labor shortage, and then people that are locked into a low rate mortgage, and they don't want to give that up. So you're, you're creating some dynamics here that's not healthy. Um, and then if we change gears to look at the components of inflation, when you look at this, uh, you see some good news in terms of we're starting to really see inflation come down. We basically hit a peak about this time last year, and the overall headline year over year inflation numbers are coming down and for the last three months energy which is this kind of a peach color or coral color has decreased um, which is important that's more volatile but i think the blue area here which is services that is starting to come down so we're, we're still in the you know upper four range of inflation the fed's target is two percent and it's going to take a lot of effort to get to that two percent level and drove and pal basically kind of mentioned that in his speech yesterday when, they, when the Fed said they're going to keep rates uh, static uh, for the near future. And they hinted that there may be a further uh, increase. So if we look at the, uh, the projections of where interest rates are and where they're predicted to be, uh, this chart is highly volatile. It will change from day to day. When we looked at it yesterday, it's total, it was totally different than what it looks at today. So what you're looking at here, this 
the head of these columns uh, is the uh, basically the Fed funds rate in basis points. So five uh, five two five to five uh, five fifty. That's five point two five percent to five point five percent. There's a the greatest probability that they're going to keep rates at this level through the the rest of the year. You looked at this the last two months. You're starting to see rate cuts happening in September or November. Now the market is thinking they're going to keep rates here and then start cutting them uh, pretty aggressively uh, during the winter. Now everything can can change quickly, but um, I think it suffice to say that rates are pretty close to their peak unless we get a bigger spat of inflation. Trey, anything you want to add to that? But yeah, the um, the Federal Reserve is still worried about inflation uh, at a core level. It's still present. Um, we've seen actually a, globally a, re a resurgence in some of the inflation central banks for the past couple of months, whether it be Australia or Canada um, and other pockets of, of Europe. They've you know been on pause for interest rates and they've come back this month and started raising rates again because inflation is still re-accelerated. Um, the, the Fed had a meeting yesterday. Uh, they had a hawkish tone, some of the hawkish uh, dot plot. Uh, they didn't really back it up with some of their speech, so I think the market's calling a bluff on them. Um, but uh, they made it very clear that they do not intend to cut rates anytime soon, but we are close to that peak level, uh, and they intend to hold them until inflation is behind us. Okay. So we're going to change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about China. And a lot of people are saying, well, China is going to replace the U.S. as the number one economy in the world. They have you know, 1.4 billion people. Their economy is growing faster. They don't have political infighting. If you disagree with them, you are eliminated. Um, anyway, but what this chart shows is uh, that uh, today, 71% uh, or the China economy, 71% of the U.S., and the closest it will get to uh, surpassing the U.S. is going to be about 2035 at 90%. Then you have this divergence or convergence, I should say. And the reason for that is twofold. One is the demographics of China is similar to Japan. And what I mean by that is um, China has had this one-child policy that uh, has been gone for a number of years, but culturally it's been adapted uh, in their country. So they are going to have a lot of older people who are not working and not very many young people uh, that can support their economy. That's one challenge they have. The second challenge is if you are an investor, how many people on this call would be comfortable investing into a, a Chinese company that's very opaque and with the CCP, who's basically the mafia, for lack of a better word, um, they will do whatever benefits China and they don't care who they hang out to dry. And many of you on this call have dealt with Chinese, have been to China, you know how they conduct their business. Um, we were on vacation recently and, and there was a group of Chinese in this group and they wanted me to take their picture. And I jokingly made the statement, Candace got mad at me. And I said, you guys aren't part of the CCP, are you? And, he, and they look like deer in headlights. I went ahead and took the picture, but it was kind of funny to see their reaction. Um, anyway, uh, China is not a, a worried overtake the U.S. in terms of, a, 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 of overall dominance in the world. The United States, with all our flaws and problems and political uh, chaos, we still have the most level playing field. And if you don't believe me, look at all the people trying to get into this country from all around the world. So um, one of the things that we look at is, OK, we're going to have this potential recession. How bad is it going to be? It's going to be dictated by the U.S. consumer. And we hit a peak during the, the COVID you know, pandemic. People couldn't go out and spend money. They couldn't travel. Uh, half the half of the, of the of the U.S. was terrified of COVID. The other half wasn't as concerned. Um, you know, being on vacation with all the people that hadn't traveled for three years, it's, it's very packed. Um, but you see that we still have a pretty heavy amount of savings left, and that's going to help cushion the recession. You can see here these red bars below. This represents uh, people dipping in the savings to pay for food, clothing, and shelter. Um, Trey, I'm going to let you talk about this next chart. Um, you know, the government produces information and data, then they always come back and have revisions. And it's um, somewhat distressing because you hear a number and you think, well, that's good or bad. And, and then there's a revision. So why don't you kind of talk about what happened in 2008 and the data revisions? Yeah, so this is a picture here of GDP data uh, reported throughout the 2008 year. In the, the dark blue bars are the original point in time 
uh, GDP data and the light blue bars are the final or uh, the GDP data uh, reflecting the latest revision uh, you know that happened in this in the subsequent two or uh, two years or so and so um, this is uh, illustrative of the data that we get now uh, is almost always going to be revised and sometimes to a, a material level and it can drive behavioral issues um, that would make you kind of deviate uh, from whether you're an investor, whether, you know, it'd be your, your wealth plan. Uh, and in, in particular, if you're the Federal Reserve, um, it can kind of help you deviate to cut rates when you shouldn't. So this was a story in the 70s, really, uh, in the mid 70s, when the GDP uh, showed contraction at over 10% annualized. So the Fed cut rates um, to spur the economy. It was ended up around 2%. They ended up setting off the next inflation wave. Um, here, uh, we're looking at GDP that in some cases was positive uh, throughout 2008 and was revised negative. Um, and so, uh, you know, this data, we won't know the final data. Um, even from last year, we won't know that uh, final revised data for several quarters from now. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about well, the two negative quarters last year. Was it that a recession? And the truth is, is probably not. Um, it doesn't mean that it didn't matter for, for you as an investor. Um, so, but this is a tale in... Um, taking data with a grain of salt and always keeping a mosaic theory in mind, not uh, drawing conclusions from any one piece. Yeah, and, and what, what you've seen happen is, um, depending on who's in power in Washington, they're going to create statistics that make them look as good as possible. And, and I call it moving the goalpost to fit the, the political power establishment. And w the reason we're sharing this with you is just be real careful when you hear data in, in the news or social media if is it really good or bad, you have to find multiple data points to really find out what the truth is. It's kind of like you, you watch the news, um, depending on their bias, you may like what you hear or, or not like it. You have to get multiple points and we do that. And that makes a big, uh, a big part of how we make investment decisions. So we continue to make what we call fact-based decisions. Now we talked earlier about, there's a uh, very small segment of the market that's holding up the indices and what happened in 2022, these sectors were some of the poorest performing sectors, consumer discretionary, communication services and technology, and they're leading the overall markets um, this year. And some of these other sectors are really lagging. And uh, as we go into a recession, um, these are going to retract and become negative and these others will not be as negative and actually uh, recover quicker. So that's how we're positioning the portfolios, looking at more of these sectors here, but we still have gains. And more, even be more specific on this next slide, what you see is these stocks here, it's the FANG stocks, plus you're adding NVIDIA um, to that, and Tesla, they're up co collectively 54%. The S&P is up 12% year to date. Um, but if you look at, you take out these seven stocks, the rest of them are only up 2% cumulatively year to date. So it's a very narrow range. And we own some of these stocks and we've owned some of them in the past. Um, we're not buying in, into these uh, sectors right now because they're too expensive. Um, a lot of times there's this you know, fear of missing out that's kind of you know, ratcheted these returns higher. You don't wanna be you know, chasing returns and think it's gonna continue. That's a, that's a good way to lose money. So we're just being very, very cautious. Uh, Trey, you want to add some comments? Yeah. So the um, it's it's and it's been talked about ad nauseum at this point. Is um, you know the kind of the big mega cap stocks, maybe the top five, top ten largest stocks, really controlling the market this year. And um, and that's generally what we would refer to as kind of weak breath. Um, weak breath doesn't have to resolve itself with stocks going lower, but it should at least resolve itself by uh, markets catching up. That's not quite the case. Um, and so it doesn't mean that it's dogmatic, but it doesn't mean that it's healthy. Um, and so we would like to see a little bit more broadening in this here. Uh, these stocks, um, in, in a couple of them, uh, there's quite a mania going on. Uh, we're talking about companies that do 40 billion in revenue. Um, and have a market cap of over a trillion dollars, um, undiluted. And so uh, there's, there's clearly some euphoria. People are tired of sitting on some cash um, and they don't, know, they don't know what to do with it. And so they're just rushing into these narrow areas of the market um, and just in searching for yield and return. 
Um, unfortunately, it's kind of like potential energy. The, the farther you drag things away from the earth, the further they kind of have to fall. Um, that's usually how these types of things resolve themselves when you get too big of advances too quickly. I think the market's probably at a pretty vulnerable place here uh, in the short term, uh, and it would at least expect some sort of leveling off here. Um, but uh, this has just been the story of this all year. Um, we saw since the last time we spoke, uh, the NASDAQ has cut its losses from peak to trough in half. And, um, and, and again, it's really just dr driven by that top five to 10 stocks. When you look at the NASDAQ itself, it has been the best performing indice, but still over a quarter of the stocks in the NASDAQ are down over 75% and they're really not moving. So there's just, uh, there's, no, there's no kind of drain down for performance. We'd like to see that change. Um, and um, it, it kind of leads us into the next slide here, which is um, what we're looking at when we talk kind of cap weighted indices and equal weighted indices. So cap weighted, all that means is just, if you're a big company, you get a big slice of the pie. Uh, equal weight is exactly what it sounds like. Everybody, whether you're big or small, gets equal slice of the pie. Um, and so uh, the line on the chart here, that white line, just represents the ratio of that equal weighted indice versus uh, the, uh, the cap weighted index. And so um, generally when that line is moving up, your average stock is performing quite well. Uh, that also coincides with kind of a strong economy. And kind of conversely, uh, when you see that white line starting to move down in weakness, it generally occurs as the economy is getting really weak and the average stock's doing quite bad. Um, and, and kind of everybody rushes to the top to try to find some sort of safety. That's not unlike what's going on now. Uh, that doesn't really surprise us. It does surprise us in the velocity at, in the, in, in, in which it has occurred. Um, but that is uh, just something that we kind of look at and say that that is a general occurrence with kind of the, the macro theme that we feel uh, characterizes the environment, which is simply weak. Um, and um, do you, Mitch, do you have anything to add on that before I go to the next slide there? No, I, I, I think what you have is you just have a very narrow range of stocks doing well, and it's, it's very difficult to, as an investor um, to invest money when the market's going up and the fundamentals for the majority of the companies are not solid. So we're kind of in this waiting game. It's not like we're in cash and treasuries across the board. Um, you know, we're fully invested. We're just being somewhat conservative and there's going to be a better entry point into our, some of our stocks. We're generating the yields we need in our covered call portfolios, our models, growth, growth with income, growth income with communities have held up well. Those are fully invested. Those are ETFs. But it's just, we're just, we're, we don't want people to look at the NASDAQ year to date and say, oh gosh, look how well the NASDAQ's doing when it's only a handful of stocks and they're extremely overvalued right now. There's going to be a correction at some point. And the other part, there's some seasonality. When you get into the summer season that we're in now, a lot of your traders go on vacation. This really becomes more commonplace in August, especially in Europe, when Europe's on vacation. You don't have the traders to, to buy as much stuff. So you, a lot of times you see pick up and, and volatility in the markets in the summer because there's not as many buyers as there normally is in other times of the year. So we're, we're just anticipating a little more volatility this summer. Um, so again, we're just being cautious to, to protect, protect your money. Um, this next slide, and, and I'm going to let Trey talk about this. Uh, you know, we got into a new bull market um, after the October lows. But um, like we've we've been saying for months, this is fool's gold. This is not a new uh, a bull market that's going to have legs that we're going to be able to, to stand on. Yeah, thanks. So this uh, chart here is just a chart of the S&P 500 uh, going back to uh, kind of uh, 1927, in fact. So um, the, the red circles on that chart are uh, highlight areas in which the, the market measured by the S&P 500 has rallied 20% uh, from some sort of local bottom there. And so um, that's kind of what you're seeing in the papers now is um, a new bull market has, has been created. Um, and there's really, it's kind of a misnomer of a label um, and the returns are mixed. And that's exactly the picture we want to paint here is that at certain times uh, that was a, a good, uh, indication that markets had priced in enough weakness that they could then look forward to the future. That's evidence kind of through the 60s and 70s um, in the early part of the 80s. Most recently, 2008, 2000 bubble, um, it, that was not the case. In the 1920s and 30s, that was not the case. 
Uh, in fact, that occurred, that 20% rally occurred, and then markets continued to go down. Um, and, and in some cases, the range was another you know, 50%. I, I'm not forecasting. I just, it's aware, it, it's, it's um, prudent to be aware of those things uh, so that we don't get misled, kind of going back to that data revision. Uh, there's stuff that's being talked about now that's really just a distraction. Um, and so this, um, this chart here is just to illustrate that. Uh, labels can be misnomers. That's what this illustrates. Uh, kind of the last slide we have here. Um, there were many different uh, illustrations we could use for this, but uh, this here is just one of them, uh, one of the momentum indicators. This is just showing how overbought the market is, how over it skis, it's really skiing. And um, so when that gets, when that blue line gets up into that red territory, so what we would say is extremely overbought, you would, you know, forward returns would be very weak. And so you'd want to sell that market and, if, you know, buying low, selling high. Um, so we're uh, we're up in the skies right now. I think markets are particularly vulnerable right here. Um, I think I've heard it best said that markets tend to kind of exhibit some whistling past the graveyard here. Um, and so for us, uh, the stocks we own, we like them. Um, they're a little more conservative, but they do well in bear markets. They do well in weak economic environments. Cash we sit on gets deployed into risk-free treasuries at over 5%. Um, all of our passive models have done really well. The, the active strategies of call selling have weathered quite well through this. Uh, if you're in, in any of our ADV models um, or even almost stock income, um, it, after today, you woke up and you said, what bear market? Your, your money has fully round tripped at this point. So they've held up quite well, even though the volatility, it's been a long ride. Um, and we don't think it's quite done yet due to that jobs picture. There's some liquidity exiting the market uh, throughout the year. The Fed is going to continue to be hawkish and labor markets are rolling over and the consumer is not as cash strapped as they were last year. Um, and so we, we, we strike a tone of cautiousness, not of doomsday. And um, there's plenty of opportunities, like we said, in, in the treasury market where you can, um, you know, deploy your money for quite competitive rates and sleep well at night. And kind of yeah. that's what we're doing with some of the cash until we see better opportunities. Yeah, and, and many of you have asked, hey, where can I go and get a good money market rate? Because your big money center banks don't want you to take money out of their bank, but they pay you basically nothing. I um, mean, go to the, the website, bankrate.com. Again, that's bankrate.com. We have no affiliation with them, but you can get a number of money market accounts and other cash options. Um, we've talked about our T-bond ladder, which is uh, many of you have invested in that takes advantage of this um, interest rate situation. When rates get cut, uh, you're gonna have uh, you know nice gains in it for a cash position. It's a 12 to 18 month hold. And then as we kind of wrap up our presentation, um, we have our, our Advantage, Advantage Plus and stock income on a million dollar portfolio. This is what we target to do. And this is what we've done trailing 12 months. Um, and the goal here is we want these portfolios to grow so eight, you know, five, two and a half, eight percent of a bigger base is going to produce more money long term. Uh, historically, we were uh, distributing too much money where we really kind of um, impeded the growth of the portfolios. But this is the kind of income that, that you can expect going forward. Um, so as we uh, as we wrap up, um, we're going to open this up for Q&A. We appreciate everyone's time and confidence, Influent Financial, and I hope everyone has a safe and wonderful summer. So I'm going to stop.